I'm Jake. Welcome to Rush Reviews. And today I'm going to be talking about the Scream trilogy, movie by movie. Scream 1 came out in 1996. It was directed by Wes Craven and the screenplay was written by Kevin Williamson. In fact, Scream 2, 3 and 4 were also written, in, written by Kevin Williamson and directed by Wes Craven. So, day 2 work is a pretty good team. Scream 1 is actually my personal favourite, but then again Scream 2 is right behind it. Scream 3, on the other hand, in my opinion, is definitely the weakest until Scream 4. What happens in Scream 1? Well, Scream 1 actually takes place a year after Sidney Prescott's mur- mum's murder. I was... Yeah, Sidney Prescott. I'm, I always get Sidney Prescott... I always say Sidney Campbell, because it's played by Nev Campbell, and her character is Sidney Prescott. But, yeah, Sidney Prescott is played by Nev Campbell, and she's a pretty likeable protagonist. We also have two other characters in this movie, which continue throughout the entire Scream universe, which is David Arquette and Cody Cox's character, who we know got married because of Scream, actually. They met on the Scream set, and they fell in love. Who knew, eh? Ghostface could create love. But yeah, Scream 1 actually begins after Sidney Prescott's mum's murder. A year, actually, coming up. And everything seems to be going wrong. There seems to either be a copycat killer or the original killer comes back. Now, it opens up kind of different to your traditional movie. Uh, at least from the 80s. There's not a POV shot or anything. In fact, we were with the victim throughout most of the opening scene. We were a part of the game. Now, what's interesting about Scream 1 is that the killer actually uses all the older movies from the past generation, the 80s generation, you know, the decade of slasher movies, as part of his game, which I found really interesting, because it's still taking everything from the the horror movies of later days and using it as motivation for killing in this generation, which is really interesting. Plus, I mean, the costume itself is actually really cool. It's designed throughout the screen painting it's taking that kind of design with it it's sort of like a, a banshee ghost mixed with this painting and it's really interesting and the killer as well speaks kind of like freddy krueger another one of wes craven's movies which started to really change tone throughout the franchise making fun taunting the victims it's a really interesting premise and it kind of gives the killer a little bit of personality but not too much because of the you know dead cold black eyes but Scream 1 itself is actually really interesting, and off the bat we actually get a lot of chemistry between a lot of the characters, I mean, there's a lot of conflict already, when Courtney Cox's character, uh, Gail Weathers, and Sidney Prescott's character first meet, we clearly see that those two do not like each other, Gail Gail Weathers thinks that uh, Sidney Prescott wrongly accused Cotton Weary for the murder of her mother, and wrote a book about it, and we see this already, so immediately the audience has something to be interested in, we we see that, well, who could be the right one here, I mean, Sidney Prescott's kind of younger and, and a little bit immature, maybe she was just really angry, Cotton Weary was one of hers, or Gail Weathers is just a tabloid hungry looking for, I mean, she already, she says it as well, you know, she shouldn't be here, she should be following the Sharon Stone stalker and all that kind of stuff, so uh, immediately we do have conflicts of interest, which is quite cool, but in the middle of this we have The Rock, which is Dewey, and it's really interesting to see how him and Gail Weathers' relationship uh, develops throughout the movie, so that's kind of why Scream is much more interesting, it's more than just a mass killer going about killing people, we're a little bit more invested in everything that kind of happens, plus that as well, I mean, the kill scenes are actually pretty cool, with the killer, you know, stalking and taunting before, as well as uh, in this movie, he actually goes after Sydney pretty close to the beginning of this movie, I'm pretty sure she's the second person to almost be off, which is pretty cool to see, and from there we actually get to see how she steps up to the plate and how she can handle herself against a masked psychopath wielding a knife, you know, as you see in the background. Uh, in a way, yeah, I mean, she she can she fights him, but she's definitely under the knife, you know, in that sense. She's never really got much on him when he attacks her, but we see how she can still get herself out of that situation and still get herself to safety, phone the police and all that kind of stuff. And from there, we are introduced to 
well, we're not introduced there, but we are introduced to the meat of this movie. It comes to that point, who is the killer? Now, of course, Sydney Prescott, she's a beautiful looking girl for the time anyway, 1996. She has a boyfriend, Billy Loomis. And she has, she has a group of friends, you know, consisting of, you know, Randy, the movie geek, the best friend, Stu, who's a bit wacky and also went on to play Shaggy in the Scooby-Doo movies. So, and she has her best friend. It, you know, there's a group, and we, we spend a good bit of scene time with, screen time with them, but of course, Billy Loomis is the one that's framed. Whilst he's in jail, she gets that phone call, You fingered the wrong guy! So, in that sense, we start to think, well, who could the killer be? I mean, there was a good bit of evidence that said that Billy Loomis was the killer. Holy shit! You know, this movie keeps you on your toes, it keeps you guessing, it has a good killer in it, it has good characters in it, it has more than just one plot going on and I think it does it really well and I think that's what Wes Craven does really well puts in character conflicts as well as oh there's a guy trying to kill me but what about my boyfriend kind of thing um, so the movie in itself comes to a climax at the house uh, where there's a party and then after the party ends stuff starts going down we find out who the killers are spoiler alert it is Billy Loomis but it's also Stu Mocker the best friend that ends up becoming Shaggy I'm going to be honest I think being the killer was a good movie for his career, as opposed to being shaggy. Is it a good movie? Of course it is. Is it a good ending? Of course it is. The whole concept of using movie plots as part of your plot was pretty genius for Wes Craven's idea, so it meant that everyone from the 80s were in on the kind of joke, if you will. Uh, the fact that th- this killer used the, the movie's definitely was was interesting to me and that's kind of why I was like well this definitely is one of my favorite horror movies um but unlike uh, unlike most of the the franchises made in the 80s this one wasn't actually milked too much it definitely had the trilogy but after that we had to wait a few years actually more than 10 years before the fourth one came out I wish the fourth one hadn't came out but Overall, the first one is definitely one of the best horror movies you can watch to date. It doesn't matter about all the stuff that's coming out these days. If you want a good story and a good plot and a good killer, uh, Scream's definitely the best place to go. Moving on to Scream 2. Scream 2 is set in Windsor College. Sydney Prescott goes to college after, you know, surviving high school, if you will. And wouldn't you know it, everything starts happening again. The intro to this one's a little bit different. It happens at the movies. Once again, that whole, you know, media violence crossing over into real time. uh, And the way the the teens get dispatched is pretty interesting as well. Guy gets a knife in his ear from the toilet, or in the toilet. Um... And his girlfriend gets stabbed to death in a the theatre. No one does anything because they think, oh, it's a part of the show. And the same basic thing ensues. There's a police investigation throughout it. Sydney is targeted again. Dewey, Gail come back. And we basically have our set up. Kind of like the first one, except I personally think that some of the characters in here were a little bit stronger. We have Randy, who's one of the newest characters. We also have our, our friend again. I'm not too sure. I can't remember her name. Um... But this seems to be a much better kind of casting crew. Of course, Sydney has a boyfriend again. So the killer plays on that again. It plays on the kind of idea, not only movie violence, but it, it continues a plot from the first one as well and twists that it on itself. Now, not really, not much really happens in the second one that really in- progresses the story. However, it is very interesting and the ending's really cool as well. Though, when it's... Um, the killer's coming, where is he? Right here. And he, he comes onto the stage and, and he, he's like, he's, he's mocking the whole concept of boyfriend killer, boyfriend killer. Uh, of course, the killer ends up being Randy. Now, this is one of the main problems I have with the second one is the twist. There's a twist in this. It's just like there's a twist in the first one where we find out that the killer's Billy and Stu, which is pretty interesting. The twist in this one, however, which is the... The relation to the first one is the killer, and this one is Billy Loomis's mum, who comes in. Now, the, the issue I have with this movie is we never get to see her in the first one. We never get to see her any pictures of her throughout this. So, you know, saying, oh, that random character that you've never seen before is actually connected because that's their mum. Well, that's pretty cool. But how was I meant to know that, you know, kind of thing? Which sucks.
Sorry about that. I coughed my head off for about 10 minutes. Um... However, I will say that the second one's definitely good. That whole twist with Billy Loomis's mum was kind of the weakest part of the movie. Uh, and then, obviously... And then, oh, yeah, we also have Cotton Weary in this movie. I don't know why I missed him out, because he's actually a very big part of the movie. He seems to be the Billy Loomis in this movie. He seems to be the one where you don't really know where his head's at in the movie, and he seems to be a little bit whack. Um... And the movie's leading you to believe that maybe you'll become the killer. And there's definitely a point where Billy Loomis's mum is like, she sent you to prison for a year. This is kind of like karma. And we kind of see him change. And he's like, well, yeah, if I shoot him, then I could become rich and famous. But of course he doesn't. And he's actually a good guy. And it's a good ending, to be fair. I think Scream 2 is, is, is definitely worth a watch. Uh, as a package between Scream 1 and Scream 2. There's not really much between them. Uh... Of course, Scream 1's going to be the stronger one. Sequels kind of suck. And I think it's quite meta in the movie as well because we do have... Uh, we do have that whole conversation when they're in the college about how sequels are inferior movies and all that kind of thing. So it was almost like Wes Craven saying, look, I know this one's not going to be as good as the first one, but we're definitely trying and we want to put Ghostface back in another movie because you, the fans, love it. And I think that's really interesting. Moving on to Scream 3. In fact, before I go to Scream 3, I want to say that the new guy isn't Randy. Randy does make a return after being poorly edited in his shooting. He gets shot in the shoulder, but somehow it launches him all the way over to the fucking table in the first one. But yeah, he he makes an appearance. Mickey is our new film geek, and him and Randy definitely have a few good scenes together. They talk about how Return of the Jedi, and he's like, ah, not a, not a sequel, part of a trilogy. These little bits are movie gold in the fact that they're, they they talk about things that all of us have conversations about, making it a little bit more realistic. Anyway, Mickey's a killer with Billy's mum. Moving on to Scream 3, the tone drastically changes. We are now in Los Angeles or Hollywood and we open with Cotton Weary. Cotton has his own talk show after being accused of being a murderer but then being cleared. He's kind of like OJ Simpson but, you know... He wasn't guilty. Um, we see at the beginning of the movie, he gets a call from Mr. Mysterious, who's spying on his girlfriend. Now, this is a POV shot. We have a POV shot at the beginning of the movie, which is pretty interesting. Uh, going around Cotton's house, following his girlfriend, and the girlfriend kind of gets stalked. The movie music plays and all that kind of stuff. And it's pretty interesting, actually. This bit is pretty interesting. She goes into a door, he's chasing her. You know, and he starts stabbing the door, kind of like, uh, kind of like The Shining, but, you know, not with an axe, just with a knife. And he's like, I just want to see how fun it would be to take the game to the next level. Next level? Yeah, I want to see how fun it would be to, guys, your fucking eyes out! Or, you know, something like that. And, and it's pretty psychotic, it's pretty interesting, and definitely pretty fucking funny as well. Cotton goes in and, well, he gets killed. Yeah, Cotton was a, kin- a repeat character throughout the whole, uh, damn trilogy, and he gets off in the third one, but that goes with the whole storyline of the first, of the first, second, and third, following these rules, I've not spoken about them yet, because I'm going to speak about them, well, the whole concept is that Cotton Weary is a main character, he, he becomes a main character in the second one, but he's definitely a, a, a tertiary character in the third, the first one, he kind of progressed the plot for everything to happen, and he dies in the third one. But the tone of the third one is, in the third one, all bets are off. That's part of the the rules. As the movie continues on, we're in Hollywood. Dewey is no longer with Gail Weathers, as he, na- he never is in any of the movies. You know, he, the first one, they get a relationship. The se- second one, turns out Gail moved away. And the third one, same thing kind of happens again. But the third one kind of wraps it all up and, you know, they do get married. Spoiler, I guess. But it's a happy ending for them. Yeah, they don't die. Um, so the third one has the guy from Grey's Anatomy. I can't remember his damn name now, but, uh, yeah, Nurse Hottie from, from Grey's Anatomy. I've never actually seen Grey's Anatomy. It was my girlfriend that, that you know, took a look at him and, oh, he's in Grey's Anatomy. And I was like, yeah, well, he gets his fucking head kicked in in this movie anyway. But, yeah, so the movie changes tone. Uh, throughout it, uh, this the, the third one's definitely kind of more of a mocking version of Scream. I mean, there's still a lot of kills in it and all that. Well, 
throughout the Scream movies, there's been the Stab movies, which the second one, they were at the cinema to see Stab 1, which is actually based on Scream 1. And it's pretty cool to see, well, on Scream 3, they're on Stab 3, and someone's copying the script and killing them off one by one. Of course, we have a movie version of Dewey, a movie version of Sydney, a movie version of Gale, and the originals come back as well. Of course, the killer wants to kill it wants to seek out and kill Sydney. why you ask well we find out that in the third one we go back to the original which is very interesting and although the third one is definitely the weakest movie wise story wise is probably the strongest on par with the third one see they follow these concepts of the rules and in the third one they do bring it all full circle now i'm going to talk about the rules before i actually talk about the ending because you need to know about the rules so in the first one they talk about how, you know, virgins are always going to survive, you know, that's that's how Jamie Lee Curtis always outsmarted Michael Myers, uh, how you shouldn't do drink or drugs, and then obviously they do drink and drugs, so it's quite funny in that one. And number three is, never say I'll be right back, because if you say that, you're going to be dead. And then he's like, I'm going to go get a beer, you want one? Uh, yeah, I'll be right back! And that kind of stuff is pretty pretty funny. Then the second one, the, mo- the rules actually get a little bit more intense they actually become a little bit more part of it i think in the this one it was basically they were just talking about rules showing how randy and you know watched all these movies and 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 was just able to tell you off the bat what happened in these movies um for someone to get killed and and what you need to do to survive whereas in the second one randy kind of becomes a criminal psychologist helping do it out but it kind of makes sense because he's actually just talking about it through movies um, however, in the second one, they have to do their best to outdo the first one, so there's going to be a lot bigger kills. Um, the body count is always bigger. Uh, the death scene is always much more elaborate, basically meaning that the main characters in the second one will be fair game. However, they probably won't die, but it might be the secondary characters. In that sense, Randy paints his own funeral, because Randy's is not a main character, he's a secondary character, and th- wouldn't you guess it, in the second one, he does die. Now, bring on to the third one, Randy's sister brings a video, and Randy's on there, and he talks about the rules to the third one. Now, this is probably the darkest part of the movie, or the saddest part of the movie. That's when we see Randy talk about these rules through a video. And he talks about how, if you're watching this, I, I probably haven't made it. Which is really cool, but they do sprinkle little bits in it with his roommates chapping on the door. If they just left the roommate out, and this guy was talking about the rules. I mean, he has a sad look in his eyes. That would have been perfect. That would have been a great tone of the movie right there. Uh, but Randy's basically talking about how in the third one, all bets are off. You know, anything that happened in your past can come back to bite you in the ass and... It's, yeah, I mean, that's pretty fucking heartbreaking. And the fact that he acknowledges that the chances are, because of the rules that he kind of loves to live by, he's probably going to die. You know, uh, the, the, this video was filmed before the second one, so he's aware that this killer's probably going to kill me, which is a lot hard-hitting because in the second one we actually see him a little bit in denial after his little film class, you know, when we first see him, he's in denial about the whole thing, and this just adds a little bit more of an impact to the fact that this guy's in denial, and it turns out that he is going to die in that movie, so that's pretty interesting, and it's a pretty good turn of pace, but overall, the whole concept of this movie is kind of shit, Jane Silent Bob make a cameo appearance in this movie, as much as I like Kevin Smith, and I can't remember the other guy's name, but as much as I love Jane Silent Bob, I really, you know, why they were in this movie, I have no idea. Um, I guess it just adds to that kind of comedic tone that they decided to go with. Uh, and then at the end of Scream 3, we find out that it's actually her brother. And her brother talks about how he killed her mother because the mother, back in the day before becoming Sydney Prescott's mother, was an actress in Hollywood. She got fucked three ways from Sunday, his words not mine gave birth to him, abandoned him, and then he went looking for her, and found her, but she didn't want anything to do with her, with him, so he got really pissed off, and killed her, and essentially said to Billy, and blamed it on Cotton Weary, of course, and then I said, essentially brainwashed, or bribed Billy Loomis, uh, and Stu Mocker to go out and basically just, you know, take the 
Ghostface name and continue on like good old puppets. Which is quite interesting. It's actually quite interesting to be fair. It does bring the whole story full circle. Which is really cool because a lot of trilogies or a lot of movies don't actually stick to the same plot. Whereas I implode, I implore Scream because it done that and it did have a continuous story throughout them. The second one's probably the weakest in the stories because it didn't really follow it too much. But again, it does stay on track to a point. Definitely the first and the third. Story-wise, you know, the whole mother dying and who's the killer, who's the real killer, all that kind of thing. Definitely the strongest, however, the third movie in itself is probably the weakest. Um, but I would say that watch this as a trilogy. It's a continuous story and it's not hard to follow. Uh, it's got a great killer in it and although sometimes there's definitely maybe over comedic moments, especially in Scream 3, the dark moments, the killer moments, the kind of taunting killer moments are really good. There's a lot of cameo appearances sprinkled within these movies as well, so there's probably a few people that you'll that you'll recognise, which is really cool to see. So do I recommend Scream? Yes, of course I do. I recommend every single one of them. Do I recommend the fourth one? Actually, I do not. I'll talk about that in another movie. Thanks for watching. I'm Jake. This has been Rush Reviews.